I came over from Serbia at age 13 with my mother. My older brother, who was 15 years older than me, had lived in America for a few years and he sent for us. My mom wouldn't be staying, although at the time I wasn't aware of that. Anyway, we landed in New York City and the plan was my brother would come get us. However, my niece decided to come early and my brother's wife went into labor shortly before we landed. My brother couldn't leave his wife so he asked a co-worker of his, they drove cabs, to pick us up in New York City and drive us to New Jersey where him and my sister-in-law lived. When we got to New York City we waited in customs for what seemed like forever. We looked for my brother but didn't see him. This was the early 90s and cell phones weren't as commonplace and even if they were my mom and I didn't have one. We panicked a bit not seeing my brother or my sister-in-law. Suddenly we heard our names being called and saw a tall man. He introduced himself in perfect Serbian and explained he was a good friend of my brother's and then told us about the baby. He said he'd be driving us the two hours from the airport to my brother's home. My mom relaxed and they happily began to converse about the baby and my brother in America. I however just felt off. This guy gave me bad vibes and regardless of my brother's friendship with him I felt distrustful of him. We drove for a good hour and a half when he announced he was going to take us for breakfast. We hadn't eaten in over 15 hours so we were starving by then. We pulled up to a house and my mom and I were confused. He insisted cheerfully that his wife was cooking us breakfast and after we drive the rest of the way to the hospital to see my family. My mom shushed me when I whispered something didn't feel right and told me that we needed to be grateful for the hospitality. We were led up into the house. It was dark and dank and dirty. Suddenly I think my mom finally got a bit nervous and started insisting he take us to my brother. Suddenly the guy grabbed my mom by the wrist. He told her that he needed a wife to take care of him in his house and when he heard my brother tell the others at work she'd be coming to stay, he knew he'd found a wife. I at the time was a scrawny little scamp of a kid and I tried pushing him off my mom but he hit me so hard I saw stars. At this point we were terrified. Neither of us spoke English. We only knew my brother's home number and he was at the hospital. Also in Serbia you don't dial 911 so even if I could I didn't know that's how you'd call the police. Anyway he tells my mom she's to clean and cook for him and he takes me to the basement where I was locked in what I now know is called the laundry room. I banged and cried and yelled but it was so far down in the basement everything was muffled. For a week we were kept in his home. He'd lock us up in the basement after my mom cooked him breakfast and he'd let us out when he'd come home at four. If we had to use the restroom there was a bathroom but that was it. Just a bathroom and laundry room. It was freezing cold down there and even us huddling together under a blanket did nothing. One morning I discovered a small window by climbing on some boxes. I managed to open it and my mother insisted I squeeze through it. I didn't want to leave her and besides, how would I get help? I couldn't read nor speak the language. However, I didn't want to live this way the rest of my life so I did as she asked. I ran once I got out and I'm sure I was a sight. A scrawny boy with no shoes, only wearing shorts and a t-shirt in the middle of November. However, that is what saved us as several concerned neighbors tried to get me to come to them. And I wouldn't. I was terrified. I kept trying to get them to follow me. The police were called and a very nice policeman tried to get me to go into his car. Then I saw the man who kidnapped us drive up in his taxi. He saw the cops and took off. That's when I made a run for his house to get my mom. Needless to say, the cop and his partner ran after me and my mother was rescued. It took another four hours for them to find someone who spoke our language for us to tell them what happened. A warrant was issued for the man. My brother was contacted. His friend had told him we never showed and my brother had been frantically calling back home to Serbia to find us. He drove up to get us and to give the cops information on his supposed friend so they could find him. They never did. Back then before 9-11 it was easy for someone to disappear. However, it made me distrustful for a long time of people and their intentions. My mom grew homesick and she ended up going back to Serbia. I stayed and finished school. 
I ended up becoming a cop in the military thanks to the nice officer that helped me all those years ago. I think of that guy who kept us prisoner every now and then, and honestly, I wouldn't mind meeting him now. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude so I've never had much luck with women and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either until like the third month of using it when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again which was odd because bots almost never message more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly eight hours from me by car, but I had to admit I really did like her quite a bit and I'd been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt that she was who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week, called most days, I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on their way there, though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond she sent me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads in a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up, but it didn't look abandoned just worse for the wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took a look at my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to go knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy, but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and even gave me a kiss, which surprised me, and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise, or...? Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't here. I still thought she was keeping up the act, and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars, and when I questioned Katie, she informed me that her dad wasn't there, and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police, and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from out the window again. I got a better look at him, and... He seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had ran out into the woods, but the cops were sure that the house was currently empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did, and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her, but she never used. I told her it was fine. The man's gone, but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out, and I'm glad she did. Later that night, I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep, and from the kitchen, 
I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was just angry. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door. And there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked, and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and found no one. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at a friend's house and I was just going to head home. I left a little after Katie did. I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. That same man was standing at the corner of the house, just watching me. I just gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever went back to that house alone. I dated and fell in love with a sociopath. This is a hard story for me to tell, so please bear with me. I'm hoping that by sharing, it'll help myself heal and maybe some other victims. You are not alone. The night we met. This was supposed to be the night I ended up ending my life. It was a cool fall evening, just warm enough for a light jacket. I was at a horse sale that I went to every month. Per usual, my friend and I checked out the tack lots and horses that were up for auction. Throughout the past few months, I had dealt with a lot of pain and hardship. My heart was as broken as it could be. All of my passion for the things I enjoyed was gone. The girl that I once knew wasn't there anymore. I walked a long, dark road of depression. Alone. I had no self-esteem anymore. I felt like I was worth nothing. I planned to end it all after the sale. I was watching horses in the outdoor ring when one caught my eye. My friend was looking for a horse and it seemed like it might be a match for her. I slipped into the ring to talk to the owner. When he turned around and looked at me it was like the world stopped turning. The horses around me were in slow motion. Our eyes met and every bone in my body went cold. I asked to try the horse out and he let me. Fast forward, my friend bought the horse. In the end, the horse didn't work out, but that's another story for another time. The owner was supposed to deliver the horse to them the next day. I didn't catch his name, and I couldn't sleep that night. But the fact was, I was still here. I had to find out who that guy was. The next day, I was out fishing on a river with my brother when my friend texted me his name, Matt. She had written a check out to him, so it all worked out. It wasn't long before I had found him on Facebook and it wasn't long before he messaged me and asked me on a date. I'll never forget that day. I spent the next week or so house-sitting for a high school friend. I invited him over for a dinner towards the end of the week. I'd never been so nervous in my life. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I made shrimp pasta and vodka sauce that night. We clicked. He ended up letting me take his truck for a spin. When we got back to the house, we were sitting in the dark talking when... He pulled me in for our first kiss. My heart melted. I remember my eyes filling with tears because it all felt so right. I swore for so long that it was right. He stayed with me until 5 a.m. He was allergic to cats, otherwise he would have just stayed the night. The next few months seemed like pure bliss. The intimacy was phenomenal. The money he blew on me spoiling me was crazy. I got everything I ever could want. His family was loaded and he wasn't afraid to show it. It wasn't until the honeymoon phase was over that I started noticing things. An ex-girlfriend reportedly texted him and told him that he had given her an STD. He then gave it to me. I was never skinny enough, my hair was never the right color, I didn't have tattoos, I only had a few piercings. I was a waitress, I drove a truck, I posted too many selfies, I texted him too much. I couldn't satisfy him anymore. He began dropping me off at the gym to work out while he ran errands just about every day. He became even more obsessed with lewd pictures of girls online, more than normal. A Tumblr blog, the whole nine yards. 
he killed all of my hopes and dreams one by one. If we were to be together, I could never ride racehorses for a living like I had wanted to my whole life. He started spending hours on end playing video games when I came over. He'd use me for what he needed and he was done with me. He taught himself how to build computers. He started building guns in his basement and fabricating and 3D printing some of his own parts for them. This should have been a red flag. About a month went by of him ignoring me, him telling me I wasn't enough and showing me pictures and videos of girls that he wanted. He told me that my family hated me. Everyone hated me. I became depressed again. I started working more and more hours just to keep myself from thinking. One night I finally had a mental breakdown. I told him about the night we met, what I was supposed to have done that night, how he saved me, how much I loved him. His answer, he left me. The next morning, he woke up and texted me saying he had no feelings for me and I could come get my things. My world fell apart around me. I lost 25 pounds, I didn't eat for weeks, my parents became very concerned and didn't let me close my door. My dad got me a job riding racehorses. It started to look up. About a month later, I landed myself in the ICU with a severe concussion. When I woke up, I thought Matt and I were still together. I got on my phone to tell him I was hurt when I saw the messages from the breakup, and I fell apart again. An entire year passed. I remained single. Matt had a few girlfriends. Somehow I managed to keep myself together. At least I had made it look like that. I worked myself to death, bought a new car, and moved out at 20. I worked two jobs and about 75 hours a week. I kept myself very busy. I had my own Adderall, alcohol, smoke, cocktail that kept myself afloat. I'll be the first to admit that the drinking did start to get a bit out of hand. I was at my parents visiting when I got a friend request from Matt on Facebook. I must have refreshed the page ten times. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Despite my best interest, I accepted it. He messaged me a little while later. He had made it through the police department and was now a county sheriff. He gave me a pretty lame apology, but I accepted it. I knew in my heart I wasn't over him. Not one bit. He took me to dinner that night and spent the night at my apartment. He actually made some good points about why he ended it with me, and I started to forgive him. I shed a lot of tears that night. We started hanging out like old times again, but the same problems started to rise. Once again, I wasn't good enough, but there was something different about him this time. He became obsessed with picking locks. We'd be laying in bed watching a movie and he'd be on his phone watching lock picking videos. He complained about my dog a lot. He always joked that he'd go missing one day. A few more weeks went by and it seemed like every once in a while his mask would vanish, but just for a second. I should have known that something was off when he sent me a text complaining about somebody dying in his arms at work. The body stunk, he said. He started driving like a nut. I vividly remember us going 163 miles per hour on a back road in his Mustang. He watched my reactions the whole time. He hardly looked at the road. We went to New York City for a few days and he took a gun into the One World Trade Center and got us kicked out. We got into a fight over the phone one night because he called me an explicit name. The next day we met up to talk. During my drive to the meeting place I was overwhelmed with a feeling of dread. I knew it was the end of us, but it was more than that. I wasn't sad. I was frustrated. We talked for about 20 minutes and I don't think his eyes ever wandered from my face. His two dark brown eyes shot through me like bullets. He started talking through his teeth, telling me that no one would ever love me, that he was in cahoots with my friends and that they hated me too. I was going nowhere in life. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. His eyes were completely dead. It's something I can never unsee. The way he was looking at me gave me chills. The voice in my head started talking. Steph, get out of the car. Get out of the car now. I trusted my gut and got out. I hurried to my car, jumped in, and immediately locked it. I saw him staring at me in the rearview mirror. I drove straight to my parents' house, bawling. They were terrified. The next day, my boss told me that Matt had apparently been driving back and forth past my work, going outrageous speeds, almost like he was showing off. But the fact was, 
He lived almost an hour from there and had no reason to be there. I reported him to his precinct who said that they would take care of it. I didn't hear from Matt for a very long time. I started to move on and feel like I was myself again, finally. I started dating my current boyfriend. For the record, he is the best and most loving man I'd ever met in my life. Matt drunk texted me one night. I told him to leave me alone. I had since moved an hour away since we broke up, and I had started to feel safe again. Tonight my boyfriend was on his way over when he called to tell me that somebody had been tailgating him for 30 minutes. It was Matt. He made it almost to my house before he finally turned off. I want to start by saying I'm a stay-at-home mom. A very stay-at-home loner mom and with my family so far away, it doesn't feel right to have them worry. I just want to tell my story. Whether someone reads it or not doesn't really matter. I am not a writer by any means. These are just my thoughts and a recap of my night. Tonight I tucked my oldest kid into bed and on my way out to my new nightly ritual of feeding my neighbor's cat, my husband made a joke about wanting corn dogs from 7-Eleven. I don't get out much and don't mind, so I said we needed milk anyways and went on my way. The neighbors were uneventful, except their one cat hooked her nail into my middle finger when I was giving her treats, and because of this I left earlier than usual and headed straight to the store. It's just after 9pm and I pulled up to the 7-Eleven, parking along the side of the building, unobstructed windows spanning the entire length of the building, and it's well lit. I immediately noticed a gentleman in blue standing up on the sidewalk. I pay no mind but start gathering my things. My finger still really hurts so I'm taking my time and cursing that gorgeous cat when I hear a man's voice mumble something. My window is partially open but my windshield is already fogging up and when I look up I see he is walking towards my passenger side. He starts trying to open the door but thank god my kids broke that door handle and it won't open. I immediately step out of the car and with me standing in my open door looking out across the windshield I say, Excuse me, what are you doing? And he starts saying over and over, Are you yellow cab? Are you yellow cab? I say again, I don't know you and I'm not letting you in my car. He realizes he can't get in and people are watching so he starts walking away from my car and I run inside. I'm a little shaken but I try to sum it up to mistaken identity. We live in a small town and our cabs are just random cars. I'm walking around and trying to make sure he isn't near my car and at one point I see him looking like he's walking away. I call my husband and I tell him a little bit about what happened just to hear him say it's probably nothing. Corn dogs in hand, I walk out and head towards my car. Visions of this guy in my back seat flashing through my head. I see him walking away from my car but now he has a backpack. Something flashes on the side of the pack and it hits me. I didn't lock my doors when I ran inside. This mother lover has my five year old son's backpack. I don't know what I was thinking but I walked maybe two feet from my car and yelled, Hey that's my son's backpack! I thought he might bolt but he started walking back towards me instead. I yelled it again and he again starts saying, Are you yellow cow? Are you yellow cow? I yell louder that that's my son's backpack and to give it back. For a millisecond, I even consider the fact that this might not be my son's backpack and I begin to panic, but I'm convinced the moment I see the bus pass. This man is still going on about a yellow cab and I looked at him, furious, the mom and bear and me coming out. I take an extra long look at what he was wearing, hospital blue pajama pants and a deep but vibrant blue hoodie with the WOT logo and the O has some hemisphere lines of something on it. All of this happens in a few seconds and I just remember looking at him, furious and telling him he's effed for stealing a little kid's backpack and to get out of here. Maybe it's because I live in Canada or maybe it was because I didn't leave the area where I could be seen but he started walking away. I went inside immediately and told the clerks but I don't think any of us knew what to do. For a second I was going to call the cops, it's just a backpack but I just couldn't help but think about him trying to get into my car with me in it. 
I called the police. I started telling them what was happening and then I saw the guy again. I followed him while on the phone and I parked way ahead of him. Time passes quickly when you're on the phone with the cops and the guy passes my car. He turns back and sees it's me and he turns around. I haven't turned off my phone so I panic but I shift into drive and start driving away. This man was not scared. He was actually walking back to my car. As I'm driving away I tell the officer, What the F was I thinking? This is so dangerous. I gave you his description his general location. I'm going home. We finished the conversation on the way and I gave them all the info I had. I don't know why I followed him. I follow a lot of true crime and I guess I just could not report a man trying to get into my car. I told the police the same. We got off the phone and I went inside. My husband is good at pointing out people's hardships and it is clear this man had mental health issues and I suspect some addiction issues as well. He was rather thin with large scabs on his face. He kind of dumbed down how I feel about it and I think that's why I wanted to write this. What happened, it scared me. I don't know why I did what I did, all of it seems so stupid. I approached the guy, I drove after him. God, I'm ridiculously slow sometimes. I did get the backpack back, but it was stupid. I received a phone call five minutes before I started writing this and the police got him. He's going to the station for the night because he is extremely intoxicated. The officer's words were, we pulled up with our lights on and he asked if we were yellow cab. A part of me feels like maybe he is just drunk or something, but a part of me thinks this guy was using that as an excuse to why he would be thinking to get in my car. Definitely had an adrenaline rush, now I'm just tired. Thanks for reading. It was a weird night. I was 18, living in college dorms several hours from home and working as a waitress at an upscale bar and restaurant. I'm short, barely 5 foot so I'm used to people being creepy and trying to intimidate me now. But as an 18 year old whose father had tried to protect her from the world and had been raised in a tiny friendly town, it never occurred to me to be scared of people who lurk in the dark. We had plenty of regulars, several of whom I became close with during my years working there and a few of the frequent diners learn my name and general facts about me, since I'm generally pretty open about who I am. One such man was tall, lanky, and several decades older, appeared to be in his mid-fifties, Joe. Joe was kind, a good man with a generous nature who owned a local shoe shop. The second time I was his waitress, he gifted me a pair of slightly worn work shoes, insisted that I accept them. Because of his kindness and the way he carried himself, People of all types flocked to him, and one of them became the first man outside of my family that I feared. Joe came in with his younger brother, about the same height, slightly bulkier build and not unattractive as I recall, but his eyes unsettled me. In high school I fancied myself a bit of a writer, but nothing in my vocabulary then or now could help me describe how unsettling his gaze was. It seemed dead, lifeless but I assumed I was simply nervous. Joe was a good man, his brother was probably just less carefree, more intense. The two dined together a few times in the coming weeks, but while Joe would normally request me as a server, he asked our host to assign one of the other servers to his table after the first time. Then one night, Joe's brother came in alone and requested me by name and I was happy to oblige. For the first time he seemed relaxed, energetic, charismatic. He was interesting, with a quick wit and a story for every topic I could throw at him. By the end of my shift I assumed he just had a hard time relaxing with his brother, and that may have been true, but through the laughter and charisma his eyes never once seemed kind. They remained through it all lifeless. Eventually it was time for me to leave, but he was still there, still expecting service. My manager offered to take over the table, he'd make sure I got the tip, but it was common knowledge I had an early morning class and likely had to do my homework. I jumped at the chance but went to finish some closing duties and asked the man, my last table, if he needed anything else. He seemed off. As soon as I said I was heading home, he seemed to harden. 
His voice was clipped and reminded me of my controlling ex-stepdad, which immediately put me on edge. I'd heard the same time often enough as a little girl right before being hit. I left immediately. I called my best friend and offered to buy him dinner if he'd meet me at a diner between the dorms and my work. I don't know why I did, I just felt that I needed someone to meet me sooner rather than later. Joe's brother hadn't in any way seemed dangerous outside of the terseness in his voice before I left, but I knew that for most of my walk, which would have been poorly lit, I would be safer with a companion. We met at the diner, we ate and laughed and headed back to the dorms, a good 25 minute walk, but only 15 or so in, the hairs on the back of my neck seemed to burn. Something was terrifying me and I didn't know why. I told my friend who brushed it off until he looked behind me and yelled. I turned and saw him, Joe's brother only a few yards behind us holding a metal bar. I don't know what they're called but you can see them at construction sites usually for a reinforcement when pouring concrete and he was holding it hard enough that his knuckles were white. It terrified me to the core and I screamed. My friend grabbed my arm and we ran and even though my heart was in my throat and I couldn't hear anything past the blood roaring in my eyes I swear I could hear his footsteps behind us. We ran to the dorms and I told security who had us wait in the office while he looked at cameras in the lot and called the police. Cops showed, but did nothing since all he did was spook us. After they left, the security man asked a few more questions and made a comment about a man standing at the entrance door for a bit before walking away. It was assumed he was homeless, but my blood ran cold. I called in for a few days, and when I went back to work, Joe was in. I told him what had happened and he nodded, didn't even seem to question the validity of what I said. His brother, it turned out, had done some time for stalking and sometimes attacking young women and had even been sent to trial for assaulting one and hospitalizing her. Somehow he managed to avoid jail time for the assault but Joe said it was only a matter of time before he killed someone. I didn't see Joe often after that and I never saw his brother after that. The owner of the restaurant was angry for a long time, accused me of running off a regular who spent a lot of money when he came in. It took a few more scary encounters to make me a little more cynical, but to Joe's brother, please never come back. When I was 18 I started working at a local restaurant fairly close to my house. I don't drive because of my claustrophobia and fear of loss of control so it was nice working in a place where I could walk to in less than 15 minutes. About a month into the job I was working late one night and a middle aged man comes in and since the restaurant was practically empty I thought it would be harmless to talk to him about his day. He sat at the bar and only drank a Bud Light and didn't even touch his chips and salsa. I don't know why I remembered this detail. He went on about how his week was rough. His mom had died recently, leaving him and his brothers parentless since his dad had died a few years back. Clearly he had a lot on his mind and I'm a very empathetic person so I just listened. His brothers somehow managed to get all of the life insurance and their parents will, leaving him nothing. He was super broken up about it and I really felt for the guy. All he had was his job at Pizza Hut. Closing time came and the guy left, thanking me for his hospitality. I didn't think anything of it. The next week I was working late again. He comes in and drinks his usual Bud Light and chats with me. Our conversations got deeper and since I figured he didn't have anyone else to talk to, I listened to his problems. I tried not to talk about myself to the customers but he was asking questions about me so I answered them. He asked about my hobbies, home life, school, etc. I told him I liked doing art and he showed me some of the wood etchings that he had done. They were really impressive so I told him that. Then he asked to see my art and I showed him some pictures on my phone. Again I thought all of this was harmless so I didn't think much of it. Closing time came again and he left. He showed up a few times a week after that and we had our usual discussions. I started noticing that when I had to close the restaurant he would stay until the minute we closed. 
I started to feel uneasy about it, but I figured I was just paranoid because of my anxiety. I brushed it off until my coworkers were closing at night when I was off and he came in asking for me. They said I wasn't working and he demanded them to tell me when I was working next. They lied and said they didn't know. He seemed angry. They said he didn't stay to drink and just left after that. And now I was kind of freaked out. He started coming into the restaurant every day. He even came in on Christmas Eve and again stayed till close. I was trying to be cautious around him and didn't say much. Then he mentioned he wanted to bring me some art supplies because he had a bunch he didn't know how to use and didn't want them to go to waste. I said that I was okay and didn't know how to use them either. He insisted. Then what he said next really freaked me out. He told me, I can come by your house and drop it off. It's too heavy to carry while you walk home. I had never told him I walk home. My mind was running a mile a minute. Had he been watching me? Had he been following me? Did he know where I live? I told him I was fine and didn't need the supplies. I repeated that over and over again until he seemed to get the point. Later I told my manager about it and he understood why I was so freaked out around him. He told me that I could hide when he came in so he thought I wasn't there. He said he couldn't really kick him out of the restaurant because he hadn't done anything to harm anyone, but he was willing to protect me from potential harm. It worked for a few weeks. The guy came in often and saw I wasn't there and left. Until one busy Friday night, we were slammed and I couldn't hide. We were so busy I had no idea he was even there. My coworker let me know and said that he had been watching me like a hawk all night. I avoided going around the bar where he sat so he wouldn't try to say anything to me until one moment where I had to maneuver around a family that was getting up to leave. He put his hand around my arm and asked for me to listen to him for just a second. I told him I was very busy and had to get back to work. He just handed me a slip of paper with his name and number on it and told me to call him whenever I wanted the art supplies. I told him that it was inappropriate. He told me that he was just being friendly. I told my manager and he told me I could go home. But I was scared to walk home because I thought he would follow me. I called my dad and he came into the restaurant and made sure the guy saw me leave with him. He had stopped showing up after that. I thought I had seen the last of him until one afternoon he came in and I didn't have time to hide because I was cleaning a table. He sat at the bar and my coworker was taking care of him. I thought he decided to leave me alone at that point so I let my guard down. Wrong move. I was cleaning a table with my back facing the bar and suddenly he had me cornered in the booth. He told me to stay where I was and that he had something for me in his car. He left and I ran to my manager's office and told him everything. He told me to hide in the kitchen and when the man came in, he asked him to leave and to not come back and that he had made me and other workers very uncomfortable with his actions. I peeked out of the kitchen and saw him leave. He was livid with a huge bag of God knows what. He saw me and stopped, but decided it wasn't worth it and left for good. It's been a year since that happened, but I still get scared any time I walk past the local pizza hut or whenever a middle-aged man sits at the bar. I can't interact with customers like I used to out of fear that they'll be like him. This happened about three years ago. At the time, I was around 15 and I had lived in New York City for my entire life. And I like to think I could handle myself in any situation because I'd seen it all. It was a Friday night and I was meeting my friend for a 9 o'clock showing of some movie near Times Square. The subways were only half full when I got on, so I wasn't complaining. I was sitting on the 6 train heading up to Times Square... I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt which wasn't very revealing at all, no makeup, and my hair was kind of a mess because I figured I was just going to sit in a dark movie theater for a few hours with one of my best friends, and I didn't really care what other people thought. I was on my phone with my earbuds in, and I noticed a guy across from me just staring at me with this blank expression on his face. I made eye contact with him, smiled politely, and Look back at my phone because I was sitting across from him and I thought he must have just zoned out. Five minutes later I looked back and he was still staring at me. 
this time smiling a frankly creepy smile. I smiled again politely and looked back at my phone, hoping he got the hint and stopped staring at me. Two stops passed and he was still staring at me. Finally, the man stood up and I calmed down a bit. By now, the train had gotten pretty crowded since we were approaching Times Square, and there were people in front of me blocking the man from view. Next thing I knew, however, the man was standing directly in front of me with the hand on the pole above me. I was getting pretty paranoid at this point, but the man was on his phone and I thought I was just exaggerating the situation and that I shouldn't overreact. My stop came and I excused myself, pushed past the man without looking at him and shoved my way through the doors. Even though I thought it was nothing at this point, I was still freaked out at the proximity of this man and his creepy gaze and something just felt very wrong about the whole situation. So I booked it out of the subway car. I thought I heard a wait behind me, but I ignored it because it could have been anybody and kept speed walking. The 42nd Street station is pretty big and complicated and usually very crowded. I considered myself lucky it was as crowded as it was that day, and as I was a pretty skinny girl and very used to dodging tourists and loud crowds since I lived in a very popular touristy area, I started weaving through the massive crowd faster than I had before. I stepped onto the first escalator a bit less nervous and pulled out my phone when a man walked up and stopped on the stair directly behind me. He was so close I could feel him breathing down my neck, and I glanced behind me to see that it was the same man from the subway. How he managed to catch up to me I have no idea, but that was when I really started to freak out. At the top of the escalator, I broke into the fastest walk I've ever walked, trying to get out of there as fast as I could without looking too distressed. I made it up a few flights of stairs and out of the huge mob of people and started to calm down, thinking again that I was definitely overreacting and that I should just calm down because it was probably nothing. Soon enough, I found a small back exit that consisted of only one turnstile and nearly no tourists, and for some reason I thought that was the perfect place to go instead of somewhere where I would be protected by tons of people. As I was walking up the stairs, laughing at myself for overreacting at a man just looking at me on a packed subway, someone grabbed my arm, very tightly. I froze halfway up the stairs and whipped around. It was the man, panting, squeezing my bicep like his life depended on it. I was too shocked to say anything and just stared him down. Hey... He said eventually, not taking my obvious fear into consideration. You are very beautiful. Thanks, I managed to say eventually and tried to rip my arm from his grip, but he just held on tighter. At this point I was starting to panic. I looked around and found that, because I had chosen the quiet exit, it led to a pretty empty side street and there were only a few people walking around. Can I have your number? Keep in mind that this man looked around 35, with a graying beard and nice business clothes on, and while I wasn't short or young looking, I was very obviously a teenage girl. I stared at him and then just said, no, as firmly as I could. I wrenched my arm from his grip and started to walk up the stairs trying to stay calm. The man followed me, and when I made it to the top step, he grabbed me again, this time so hard I winced. Come on, sweetie. Why not? You're so pretty. I said thanks again because I guess I was too polite not to, but firmly shook my head and told him, No, you can't. Why not? He asked, and I stupidly said, Because I'm 15. This was my attempt to give this man the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he thought I was some 20-something and genuinely just wanted to give me his number, right? Instead, the man just smiled wider his grip tightening, and said, So? That's illegal. So? So no! I was thoroughly terrified at this point, and I pushed him off of me and bolted out of there, down towards the more populated area. Behind me, this man was shouting at me to come back, and that we could have a good time, but I just kept running and eventually lost him in the thick crowds of Times Square. Once or twice I looked back and the first few times I noticed his head popping up and down as he tried to shove past Taurus, and I eventually lost him in the crowd. I made it to the movie safely, 
but took a huge detour to get to the theater so I could stay in the streets crowded with people. Once in the movie theater, I took the time to roll my sleeve up and noticed that the man had squeezed my arm so hard that he had left light bruises on my bicep. I don't know if that man's intentions were innocent, or what he was thinking chasing a clearly terrified girl out of a subway, but I hope I never meet him or anyone like him again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit at r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon. And maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all my stories in long compilation form. And save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in bio. Thanks so much, friends. I'll see you again soon.